Chapter 65, Need an Arm? Triskelion, Washington, D.C. December 16, 2009, 2120H Local. Fury was trying to make sense of the report that Coulson had just handed over. In particular, this report was focused on one of the projects he had placed outside of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s control, a tandem project for the Avengers Initiative, Project Tahiti, or Terrestrialized Alien Host Integrative Tissue Induction. Fury thought of this project during the time he met Carol Danvers. He had figured out two crucial details in Marvell's notes in the space laboratory. First of all, Cree were a hardy humanoid species capable of at least thrice the regeneration speed as Homo sapiens. Secondly, Cree had a similar DNA makeup to Homo sapiens. His scientist even discovered that the Cree DNA was the source of the anomalous genetic fragments found in human DNA. This basically confirmed that the enigmatic missing link was an alien. But discovering the origin of humankind was not his goal. It was the regenerative properties of the Cree. Fury acquired a heavily damaged Cree body from when Carol fought the accusers. He was able to hide and preserve the body through some of his private contacts. Good thing, too, since he now knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. was infected with HYDRA. Louis Seaver, or patient number three, survived the transfusion just like everyone else. And just like everyone else, he has exhibited some problematic mental episodes, presumably caused by the, by the genetic memory of the GH-35. Coulson reported. Subjects one through three are still going into some kind of trance and drawing some kind of symbols. Overall, the symbols they're drawing are slightly different from each other with some overlaps. Are they able to function properly? Fury asked. Even if the subjects enter a trance from time to time, it was a small price to pay to keep them alive. Only the first few months, after that, they slowly descend into madness. Placing more importance into drawing the symbols than taking care of themselves. Subject 1 needs to be put to sleep time to time just so someone can put some nutrients into his body. Coulson answered with a little sadness in his voice. The sight of his fellow agents slowly losing their sense of self made him question the viability of the project. Fury released a grunt when he heard Coulson's answer. Any suggestions? I can only think of one solution, sir. Coulson said before pulling out another file packet from his arms, opening it, and placing it in front of Fury. That's an experimental procedure created by a doctor-slash-scientist in California. It would completely wipe the memory of the patient after creating a copy of it. This procedure could also place false memories. Hmm. Do it. Start with subject one. Try to make it seem like he was just on an extended vacation if you can. Fury ordered, to which Coulson replied in affirmative. Coulson picked up the folders and said his goodbye. But before he could leave, Naruto dropped down from the ceiling. Boss sent me to tell you that Stark's mansion is under attack. The now-assumed Naruto clone said calmly. What? Fury exclaimed while suddenly standing up from his chair. Coulson, send a counter-assault team to Stark Mansion now. Don't. The Naruto clone countered. Wait for the report. What do you mean, wait for the report? Fury asked with a raised eyebrow. There's no need to send a team for now since Boss and Tony are handling it. Naruto's clone replied. He wants you to sit and wait for a report of the attack to come and since boss knows for a fact that you sent a surveillance team to the wedding. Fury quickly understood the reason behind Naruto's request. He knew that there was a team near Stark Mansion, so, at the very least, he should know about it any second now due to the sensitive nature of this event. If, for some reason, he doesn't receive word of this incident, or it takes a long time, then he could get some idea where there are some holdups in the communication ladder. Coulson, prepare a capture and containment crew as well as paramedics. 
Wait for my call before sending them out. Fury amended his previous order. Carlson nodded before leaving to do what he was ordered. Give me some details. There are 25 men. 24 of them are a standard assault team. Tony should be taking care of them, no problem. Naruto answered. How about the last one? Boss is taking care of him, so no need to worry. The Naruto clone replied. Though if you want to know, the 25th guy is the Winter Soldier. Fuck. So it really is HYDRA, huh? Fury commented. You have any idea about what they want? He asked, reasonably sure of the answer. That's easy. They want Tony's suit. Naruto confirmed Fury's suspicion. They're just going about it in a roundabout manner, since it looks like the Winter Soldier's target is Pepper. A hostage? That might just work if you weren't there, of course. Boss is banging his head on the wall since he didn't see this one coming. The clone confessed. Ever since Hydra has gone underground, Boss has pulled back on a lot of their surveillance. Only making sure to check in on them from time to time. I have got a feeling that there will be a lot more jobs in the future. Ha. Huh. Rookie move. Boss sent a swarm of clones to look into it. It turns out Hydra's science team sent the crew without notifying the higher-ups. Kind of understandable since communications dropped to a minimum. Naruto let out. One of the higher-ups heard about the mission, though, so one of them is in the control room. Tell me, where's Pierce? Damn it. I should have known. He said he had an emergency a few hours ago, and left with a reserve strike team. Fury exclaimed while slowly thinking about how to work to his advantage. Maybe get something from Pierce. Enough about that. We're just waiting for the boss to finish his fight with the soldier. Let's talk about something else. Like maybe Dr. Banner and the ever-stupid General Ross? The clone said with a grin. Don't. Fury promptly replied. He just hired a mercenary to capture Banner. Can you believe it? Trying to capture Banner while the guy is hiding in Rio. He ended with a groan. Have they found him? Not yet from what I can tell. They think he's somewhere in Mexico, which he was a year ago. It's just a matter of time before they find him. You going to send anybody to help the guy? Ross and I had an agreement, S.H.I.E.L.D. will not interfere with the military in this matter, as long as they give us constant reports, and give us access to Banner after they get him. Mostly to make sure they're not dissecting him or some shit. And here I thought you guys were the ones who wanted to open him up. Naruto clone joked, but it looked like Fury didn't appreciate it judging by his expression. We won't even try to open him up. Even getting some biological samples might be out of the question. Fury replied. First of all, that's not how we do it at S.H.I.E.L.D. Naruto raised an eyebrow at Fury's statement causing him to amend his statement. We are not supposed to. We normally just tag them and give them a contact. Secondly, Banner might just, just change during the procedure. So, that's the real reason then. Naruto said while nodding his head sagely. Either way, Ross and I never said that a third party couldn't interfere with their operation. Naruto flashed a mischievous grin. Don't worry, Nicholas. Fury's nose flared when he heard Naruto using his first name. I already have a plan brewing to help the guy in case something happens. I'm even planning on smuggling him back stateside. Please don't. Fury replied, almost pleadingly. I don't want a hulking green monster inside the country. Don't overreact. It's not going to be that bad. Naruto reassured with a wave of his hand. Besides, with how smart Banner is, 
he would have found a way back into the country if he wanted to, and Ross will be the one to get burned if something happens. He added before he suddenly focused on something. Call Carlson. They are almost done. Fury nodded before picking up his desk phone and dialing a number. You have green light. Stark Mansion, Long Island, New York. December 16th, 2009. 2200H local. Naruto jumped a few feet in front of the downed winter soldier, who was struggling to get up. He was looking around the area, and he had a feeling that this fight would be a little surreal due to the still organized and intact wedding venue. He mentally created a list of goals that he wanted to accomplish in this encounter. First, he needed to make sure that Barnes escaped this fight. This was to make sure that Steve and Peggy would be the ones to help the guy. Secondly, the camera just had to go so he could keep Hydra in the dark. The Winter Soldier slowly stood up, the Super Soldier Serum working overtime to heal his injuries. As soon as he got up, he checked his abdomen as well as his arms and legs before glaring at the masked man. Are you ready? Naruto asked with a wide grin under his mask. Sergeant Barnes didn't even try to continue the conversation, and just pulled out a knife. The two just stared at each other, waiting for someone to make the first move, but it looked like Naruto's patience ran out first. The blonde ninja decided to take out the camera strapped by the side of his head. He threw a kunai aimed squarely at the forehead of the mechanical armed soldier. Barnes jumped out of the way but Naruto was already expecting this and launched a sharp kick aimed towards his head. The soldier got grazed by the side of the head, effectively destroying the camera. Oh. Did I break your camera, sunshine? How about I break you next? Naruto teased with a sadistic grin, but the winter soldier remained stoic. Barnes rushed Naruto with the intent of a quick takedown since it was clear that he couldn't win in a prolonged fight. He aimed a stab towards Naruto's temple, but his opponent blocked it, causing him to drop the knife into his other hand and tried to stab again at the abdomen. Naruto anticipated the maneuver and grabbed a hold of the soldier's wrist. Seeing that they were virtually at a standstill, the winter soldier jumped and did a double dropkick that impacted Naruto's chest. This effectively created space between the two of them. That's rude. You don't just drop kick a person. Naruto groaned out, faking that he's hurt. It's unfair that you have a pointy thing. I want one too. Wait, I have one. He continued before pulling out a tripronged kunai. The winter soldier just stared at Naruto disinterestedly. He shifted his knife to his left hand and pulled out his pistol. Naruto flashed a grin at the Winter Soldier's action, because it looked like, like he would now have some semblance of a fight. Barnes decided to make the first move this time. He fired a shot towards Naruto, but it was easily dodged, so he rushed him while firing through half of his clip. Naruto also ran at the Winter Soldier, but he was dodging or deflecting the bullets with his kunai. When they were finally within arm's reach of each other, they crossed blades. Sergeant Barnes had the upper hand, though, since he would fire his pistol from time to time. This pushes the tempo of the fight in his favor, but it ended when he ran out of bullets causing him to toss the gun away and shift the knife back to his right hand. He was using his metal arm to deflect Naruto's kunai, but the plate armor covering his arm was slowly getting stripped off. As for Naruto, he held himself back a lot throughout the fight, though a bit less than normal. It was upgrading from fighting an academy student to a genin if he was a kage, or even an atsutsuki. Not much change but a change nonetheless. Naruto was slowly getting bored of the fight, so he decided to end the battle, and give Barnes a reason to retreat. He waited for Barnes to switch his knife to his metal hand again before making his move. When the Winter Soldier tossed his knife to his left hand and did a downward strike, Naruto deflected it with his kunai, so it harmlessly passed just in front of his face. Before Barnes could recover, 
Naruto did a leg sweep, effectively laying the soldier flat on his back. Naruto quickly grabbed onto the metal wrist while placing a knee onto Barn's back. With a quick tug and twist, he pulled out the prosthetic arm. It looked like it was pretty painful too, since the usually stoic and silent soldier released a brief scream. He tossed it aside and grabbed a hold of both of Barn's ankles and threw him far out of the wedding grounds, effectively giving the guy a reason to escape. He used his shinigan to look and see what Barnes was going to do. Naruto saw him make a call through his radio. After a few seconds, the Winter Soldier started marching towards the tree line. He created a clone and popped it, informing all of his clones about what had happened. That was too easy. Naruto mused before walking towards the metal arm and picking it up. He then used his shinigan again to look in on how Tony was doing. It looks like he's also done too, huh? Naruto leisurely walked towards the front lawn while still carrying the arm. When he reached the front yard, he saw Tony dragging the knocked out assault team towards the fountain. He was sitting the guys around the fountain after making sure that he tossed their weapons away and destroyed their tech. Need help? Naruto asked, causing Tony to look up towards him. Nah. Tony replied through his suit speakers. Is everyone okay? Yep. Naruto answered, emphasizing the P, you can leave this to me. Check on Pepper and Morgan. You sure? Yeah. They must be worried about you. You can find them in the wine cellar. Naruto said. Tony nodded before walking back inside the house. You also might want to study this thing. He called out while waving the arm around. What the hell is that? An arm. I know that it's an arm. What are you doing with a metal arm? The guy that missed Pepper earlier had this on him, so I took it off. Might be something that interests you. Tony released an audible groan before taking it from Naruto's hand. It was evident that Tony was a little weirded out due to him carrying the arm as far away from himself as possible. Naruto let out a chuckle seeing the awkward situation. Naruto finished up Tony's job of lining up the soldiers. He made sure that all of them would remain asleep by injecting them all with knockout drugs. He also took out his phone and took a photo of each of the members of the assault team. This could be used later by Fury, just in case, this event get, gets lost in the mix. Even with how high profile this even was supposed to be, Shield slash Hydra might just sweep everything under the rug. The blonde ninja also took note of the tech that they had used giving more focus to the communicators. He pocketed one of the intact ones before destroying the rest. A few minutes later, Rhodey, Happy, Tony, and Pepper, who was now wearing some sweats, walked out of the mansion. The other guests must have stayed inside the house. Where's the big bad? Rhodey asked, seeing that there are only 24 guys sat around the fountain. Got away. Lost his arm though, so that's a plus. Naruto answered with a straight face. He ran back towards the tree line outback. Everyone bought the lie, seeing no reason for Naruto to lie. What are we going to do with them? Pepper inquired, giving the unconscious men some scathing look. She was miffed that someone tried to do something on her wedding day. She really didn't want to be one of those girls losing their minds when somebody ruined their wedding, but she could be forgiven after what happened today. I called Fury to pick these guys up. There should be a team coming any time now. Naruto replied. Almost ten minutes later, a caravan of SUVs and vans drove straight into the mansion. Naruto's grin dropped when he saw who was leading the team, Jasper Sitwell. I'm going inside the mansion. Naruto informed the group, which slightly surprised them. Whatever happens, don't trust the leader of that group. Call your attorney and your security team. Contact Fury 2, 
just to be sure. The group tensed when they heard Naruto's statement. Tony and Rody flexed their hands to prepare for anything that might happen. Relax. Relax. He won't do anything blatant. I just want you guys to be alert. Naruto walked inside the mansion when he saw the group nod in understanding. Call Jeff and Kane. Tell them to come ASAP. After that, call Fury or Coulson. Coulson, whoever answers first. Tony ordered Jarvis while still wearing his armor. Of course, sir. Jarvis replied. Sitwell walked towards the group while eyeing the unconscious men. He was able to legitimately intercept Coulson's order about the fiasco on Stark Mansion. Pierce also gave him the order to retrieve the men and, if not possible, dispose of everyone. He also made a mental note to ask about the blonde masked man that went inside. I'm Agent Sitwell. Fury sent me to make sure that everything's okay. Sitwell introduced himself. Chapter 66, Coffee Date New York City, New York January 30th, 2010, 1500 H Local Natasha and Naruto are currently in a coffee shop a few blocks away from Hammer Industries' main office. For some reason, Justin Hammer decided to actually work and give some instructions to the research division. That's why Natasha and Naruto finally got to officially meet up while she's at work. So, the asshole introduced himself, then Tony said, Sitwell? Do you get sick when you stand up? Naruto barely finished telling his story before laughing hard. He, of course, used a version he could use in public. Natasha bowed her head and combed her hair over to hide her embarrassment. Naruto rarely gives a fuck what everyone else thinks of him. Natasha has also developed a thick skin for public opinion, or co-workers' opinion, due to her reputation, but Naruto's full-blown laughter is just a little too much. Everyone inside the cafe is looking at them weirdly. She basically just confirmed how bad it is to bring Naruto in a low-level infiltration mission. Naruto, honey, calm down. Natasha said while gently rubbing onto Naruto's arm until he settled down. It's not even that funny, Han, they can't use their normal term endearment due to the unlikely event that Hammer is having her monitored. Hey. It's funny. Especially the face Sitwell did when he heard it. It's like he's constipated or something. Naruto defended himself while simultaneously releasing a snicker. It's really not. Natasha countered while subtly releasing a smile. Smile. Anyway, how many creamers you have on your coffee? She asked, referring to agents and private security following them. Five. You know I like it creamy. Naruto answered while wagging his eyebrows. Natasha had to laugh at Naruto's blatant double entendre. Though you should place three sugar in your coffee. Natasha raised her eyebrow when he heard Naruto's statement. She knows where the first two bugs came from. One is from S.H.I.E.L.D., for her protection, and another is from Hammer, the creepy asshole. Now, who the hell placed the third bug? I like all types of coffee. That's one of the requirements to be a secretary. You have to like all types of coffee. Natasha replied while tapping a code on the table signaling Naruto to hide their conversation without killing the bugs. And don't diss my coffee preferences. I saw you drinking black coffee too. That's premium roast coffee all amid. You're supposed to drink it without anything added to it. Naruto answered with an indignant expression. You drank it while eating ramen. Your defense is invalid from the start. Natasha deadpanned. Naruto did a one-handed tiger seal and placed his hand flat on the table. Small black markings rapidly expanded from his hand until the circle markings just went past the couple before disappearing. Weirdly enough, no one except the both of them saw the black markings. Nobody would hear anything important. As far as everyone is concerned, 
we're just talking about how everything's going with some steamy flirting from time to time. Naruto informed with a wink. You're a man-child. I'm your man-child. Woe is me. Natasha replied, causing both of them to laugh after a moment of silence. Not that I don't love this little outing of ours, but what brought this on? Naruto asked. Can't I just have a coffee date with you, Sons? I would have believed you if we didn't just go to Ria last week. If we didn't know any better, Jess, and I would have thought you were gay. Natasha told Naruto with a blank look. I mean, who leaves both of their girlfriends, on a private beach, wearing some micro bikinis to check on a lanky nerd on the run? Oh, come on. I already made it up to you, girls. You both were practically limping for two days. Naruto replied with almost an almost pleading look. You're never going to let this, are you? Till death do us part. Ugh. Naruto groaned out. You're not even going to ask me about how Banner's doing. Natasha just stared dead into his eyes, which caused him to squirm. Please. All right. Natasha finally relented, deciding that she already let him stew for long enough. What you got on the guy? Nothing pressing on Banner's side, but it looks like Mr. Blue is three quarters of the way done with his research. Naruto answered. You finally figured how who Mr. Blue is, right? Yeah. We patched into their private network through the good doctor's laptop. We were able to send a tracking worm in their network, and it traced back to Greyburn College to one Dr. Samuel Stearns. Natasha replied. Nice. So, we can expect Banner to work his way to New York in a month or two. Naruto surmised before frowning. His time frame would be tight as fuck. Ross is already in Panama. He's maybe a month away. Is S.H.I.E.L.D. prepared for a Rio war zone? Don't even joke about that. We can't even intervene if Ross fucked it up. Natasha said with a shake of her head. You know that they are going to fuck it up. For God's sake. They got Emil Blonsky. The guy is more bloodthirsty than I am, and that's saying something. Naruto's statement obviously caused Natasha to have a headache. Let's get off this topic for a while. How's work? I'm tr trying to get fired. Natasha confessed before smirking. That's why I asked you out today. Maybe Hammer would fire me when he confirms I'm in a relationship with someone. So I'm the bait? That hurts. Naruto said with a pout. Well, I need to be fired without anything that he can hold over me. If I just fuck things up, Hammer might just use his brain and come after me. Natasha replied nonchalantly. Fury is already hinting on another mission. What the hell? How about Pepper's assistant gig? Naruto exclaimed. Sorry. I think he's going to send Agent 13 or Mockingbird. Natasha answered a little sadly. You know about General Vasily, right? You're going to intern for a pedophile. Come on. Pepper's secretary is a whole lot better. Naruto tried to convince Natasha. I'm not the one who's choosing the missions, Sons. Natasha placated. If it makes you feel any better, you can help me clean up his network after I got the A-OK. -okay. Really? Naruto asked with a hopeful look to which Natasha nodded too. In their two-year-long relationship, she already mastered how to cheer the demigod ninja up, and it all boils down to mission, assassination slash massacre, food, ramen, and sex. Since they are already eating and she's still a little weirded out when they have sex in public, so she decided to let him join her mission. Although, she's reasonably sure that he would be ecstatic when he sees her as Pepper's new assistant. It's bizarre how you are able to create sparkles come out of your eyes, and with the sunshine as your background. Natasha commented. Ha. Huh. You should have seen what Lee and Guy Sensei can do. 
Naruto replied with a slight shiver. Do I want to know? Natasha inquired with an incredulous look. No. You really don't. Naruto answered seriously before flashing an eager look. Want to see it? Yeah. Natasha mirrored his smile. Naruto revealed his shinigan before staring straight into Natasha's eyes. He used Tsukuyumi to create a compilation of Lee and Guy moments and flashing it straight into her brain. He knows that he should not abuse the most powerful eye in existence to show his girlfriend one of the most traumatic things in the multiverse for shits and giggles, but how the hell can he not try to see Nat's reaction to the unblockable genjutsu technique? The Tsukuyumi lasted only a second, but Naruto can clearly see when it stopped just by looking into Natasha's expression. Her face started distorted into a complicated expression. I regret every choice I made that led me to the one point in time. Natasha said, a haunted look. Imagine seeing that in person every time. I'm sorry. It's all right. I had years to get used to it. Naruto replied seriously. The couple stared at each other before they simultaneously started laughing out loud. Naruto moved from his seat in front of Natasha to the empty seat beside her. He then placed his arms around her waist and started snuggling her neck. Natasha leaned into Naruto and started running his hands through his hair. Okay. Not that I don't love you snuggling up to me, but what brought this on? Natasha asked. Can't I just do this because I love you? Naruto countered with his puppy dog eyes. I know you can and you will, but not this sudden. Natasha reasoned. Naruto released a sigh. Well, Hammer is on his way. Around a minute away. Naruto's statement caused Natasha's eyes to widen. I just want to mark what is mine. He bit Nat's pulse point at her neck, drawing a little bit of blood. She involuntarily released a moan. You have no problem with this, right? No. I don't believe I don't. Natasha let out in a sultry voice. Naruto straightened up and started making out with Nat hard, draw drawing attention from everyone in the cafe. The men are all looking at it Naruto, with a murderous glare, while the ladies are lightly panting from the softcore action going on in front of them. It's lucky that they sat at the far side of the room, and there are no underage kids in the cafe at the moment. Natasha swung her legs and mounted Naruto before continuing them making out. Their makeout session got so intense that their tails looked away from them. A few minutes later, two massive men in a suit are walked into the cafe and looked around. They talked in their mic before a man wearing a gray three-piece pinstripe suit with a god-awful orange tan walked in. This epitome of an egotistical asshole is none other than Justin Hammer, the CEO of Hammer Industries. He's a 5 feet 8 inches, Caucasian man with brown hair and brown eyes. He always carries himself with a particular type of swagger that causes people to either love or hates him instantly, more of a latter. The certified man-child was put on the helm of a tech company just after he got out of high school. Previously known as Hammer Technology, Justice Hammer, Justin's father, created the company with the express purpose of being the rival of Howard Stark. Justin Hammer followed his father's ideologies and repurposed the business to be a weapons manufacturing company and changed the name to Stark Industries. All of this in order to change mirror the flourishing Stark Industries. He even managed to reinvent himself to be a carbon copy of Tony Stark himself. Basically, he doesn't have his own image. Hammer Industries is a self-proclaimed rival of Stark Industries. Self-proclaimed since Stark Industries has long surpassed Hammer Industries in all aspects. The small glimmer of hope for, for Hammer to outdo Stark during the weapon contract suspension fiasco has all but been purged the moment Tony Stark revealed his Iron Man suit. Not to mention the fact that Stark Industries has somehow bounced back, smelling like daisies, and roses after they re-upped and cleaned the whole company.
They even managed to release an entirely new set of weapon systems that managed to outclass everything that's currently in the market. Justin Hammer can only think of one last thing that might be able to push Hammer Industries back in the spotlight is his company creating and selling an Iron Man armor of his own. Stark has no intention of letting his suit be used by anyone other than him. A selfish thought Hammer can get behind, but the suit's sheer effectiveness on the battlefield would make any country's mouth water. If only his dumbass research department would be able to create even a working prototype. For God's sake, they almost managed to kill an Air Force pilot during one of their testings. Good thing they managed to sweep everything under the rug. He needs to contact somebody to try and fix the guy, or the pilot might just blow the whistle. His secretary is trying to reach a Dr. Stephen Strange, but the asshole is not answering for some reason. The reason Justin Hammer made an effort to go to the cafe is because of his secretary. He hired the fine piece of ass for one reason and one reason alone, to tap the hell out of that ass until he's tired of it. The fact that Natalie Rushman is a little overqualified for a secretary didn't even cross his mind when he saw her modeling pictures. So when after almost a year of working his charm on Natalie, and she didn't give him what he wants, he was ready to persuade her even if it was repeatedly hinted that she's in a relationship. When Justin heard that Natalie would go on a coffee date with her mysterious boyfriend, he ordered his men to follow her. He also planted a bug on her just in case. He decided to drop by when his men confirmed that the guy she is with her boyfriend, boyfriend. Justin entered the cafe with his usual confident demeanor. He looked around and saw the familiar redhead practically dry humping a dark haired guy. He wanted just to pull Natalie off the guy and call his guards to politely escort the man of the premises, but cooler heads prevailed. Ahem. Hammer cleared his throat, but the couple kept on making out. Ahem. He cleared his throat again, and this time they separated. Natasha purposely ignored his boss trying to get their attention, but they can't just tune him out for long. She swung her legs out to get herself of Naruto, before sitting back onto her seat, before pulling out her compact to clean herself up. She started by wiping off her messed up lipstick and ended with fixing her hair. She purposefully took her time fixing herself up to rile up the asshole. Hey, boss. Didn't see you there. Natasha said, acting surprised. What can I do for you, boss? She asked, completely innocent of what she was doing, not two minutes ago. Well, I was meeting a client down the block when the guy's here. Hammer said while pointing to his guards. Saw you here. So, I decided to introduce myself. I wouldn't want to be a bad boss, do I? That's sweet of you, boss man. Natasha replied with false sincerity before taking a glance at Naruto, who is silently pointed to his hair. That's when she saw his hair slowly turning black. That's when she understood that he was using an illusion, everyone in the room except for herself the whole time to hide his identity. Let me introduce you to my fiancé, Nathan Umber. She introduced a hammer before turning her head back to Naruto. Han, meet my boss, Justin Hammer. Naruto stood up and walked around the table. He decided to show a friendly exterior, while subtly transmitting a minuscule amount of killing intent. The disparity between the information processed by Hammer's conscious and subconscious subconscious was more than enough to intimidate the asshole. Hey. It's nice to finally put a face on the name. Naruto greeted. He can see a slight sheen of perspiration forming on Hammer's forehead. Oh. You so Nat has been talking about me, huh? Nothing bad, I hope. Hammer said with a smile, trying to cover his nervousness. Most of it. Naruto replied seriously, but Hammer took it as a joke. Come on, have a seat. Have your grunts order for you. He added before going back to his seat beside Natasha, which was certainly noticed by Hammer. Hammer moved to sit down to the seat, where Naruto was previously sitting before calling over one of his guards. 
grande, iced, sugar-free, decaf, caramel macchiato with soy milk, extra shot, and cream. Hammer whispered to his guard. Naruto and Natasha heard the order, and they had to force themselves to stop their eyes rolling. So, what do you do for a living? Me, I'm just a humble CEO of Hammer Industries. You know, one of the best military contractors in the world. I mean, I just came from a meeting that would net me several million dollars. Nothing big. He continued with a swagger, hoping to intimidate Naruto and impress Natalie. That's awesome. Naruto exclaimed with faux excitement, before getting a more contemplative look. Though I would never personally use Hammer Tech. They just jam too much. He added, causing Hammer to grimace. Oh, I forgot to answer your question. I'm in the business of private security and investigations. I just killed 22 guys in the past three days. He didn't kill anyone personally, but some of his clones cleaned out some counting houses in Colombia as a job for a captain of local police. Naruto had to contain a smirk when he saw Hammer suddenly pale. Just got back stateside last night. Justin Hammer cleared his throat before gathering himself back. So, your private military? Hammer asked, trying to get as much deta detail as he can from the guy that's hindering him from tapping the fine redhead. Though he still can't believe that he's doing this much for abroad, he would just throw away. I have an open recruitment in my circuit if you're interested. He might just be able to get rid of the guy by sending him into deep water, and he would be there to comfort his secretary as a good boss would do. Nah, I work alone. Don't want to mess with what's working so far. Naruto replied. Hammer cursed internally that his made-up plan didn't work. His guard arrived and handed over his coffee. He decided to retreat for now and create a more foolproof plan. Though if that doesn't work, he might just need to let Natalie go. He still has other targets to go through. Anyway, I have to go for now. I still need to work on some stuff. Hammer said before standing up and looked at Natasha. Natalie, you don't need to come in for today and Monday. Have a great long weekend with your fiancé. Nathan, is it? Nice meeting you. He added before promptly leaving. As soon as he got out of the cafe and got inside of his SUV, he ordered one of his men. Look into that Nathan number. Find anything you can find and place it on my desk by tomorrow night. God damn. He's bigger of a douche than I thought. Naruto commented as soon as Hammer left the cafe. He must have really wanted to score with you if he didn't fire you right then and there. Too bad. He won't be able to get anywhere near me, that slimy jackass. Look at the bright side, I have a long weekend. Natasha ended with a smile. That's certainly nice of him. Naruto replied, mirroring Natasha's smile before looking at the wall clock. Want to wait for Jess to get out and then go to Hawaii? Chapter 67, Double Date to Disaster? New York City, New York. February 4, 2009, 1900 H. Local. I'm still surprised every time I see you in a suit. Natasha commented, commented when she got out of her room. Naruto is wearing an open-button navy blue suit, with a subtle checker pattern, and a dark orange shirt with its top three buttons undone paired with black derby shoes. He turned around to look at Natasha and saw her wearing an oversized white shirt that hose halfway down her thigh. Whether she's wearing underwear or not is up for debate. I know, right? I hate putting on these things. Naruto replied while trying to loosen up his collar. Is Jess ready? Almost. She's just finishing up. Naruto nodded before returning to his fidgeting. Natasha walked towards him and placed a hand on his arm. Calm down, Solntz. It's like you haven't done anything like this before. It's because I haven't gone on a double date with one of my girlfriend's sister. 
Nardo answered. It's easy. Just imagine that it's like having dinner at Clint's place. Except we're in public and a high-class restaurant. Nardo countered. Though I don't know which one, but based on Jess's expression, it's somewhere I'll be surprised. Natasha's smile turned a bit more mischievous, which was certainly noticed by Naruto. You know something. He added while squinting his eyes. Yes, I do. But I promise you. It's nothing bad. Natasha answered, placating Naruto. Besides, Jessica has nothing to do with it. It's all her sister's plan. Naruto took out a thick deck of cards from his pocket pulled Natasha with him to sit on the couch. I need your opinion on something. Naruto said as he handed over the deck of cards to Natasha. She took the deck and flipped through it. Which car should I go for? Three years after building his bike, Naruto and his clones continued with his hobby of making personalized hyper vehicles on steroids. From bikes to Quinjet and everything in between, he already dabbled has some idea in building most of it. But the ones that caught his attention, or if an idea suddenly strikes him, he would make it from scratch, just like his bike. As expected, all his car builds have quickly filled up his warehouse slash garage. That's when he decided to create a new system to store his masterpieces instead of buying new warehouses. What he came up with was the card garage system. Each card is made with an ultra-thin sheet of chakra metal engraved with storage, reading, color change seal, and chakra storage seal. Naruto had placed an information seal on all vehicles that have data on its specs with both standard and chakra enhanced modes. When the car is stored inside a card, the information seal would be read by the reading seal with the details and appearance displayed on the card using the color change runes. Naruto was convinced it's one of the best ideas he ever had since Nat and Jess can seal and unseal a car just using a drop of blood and the spare chakra in the chakra storage. Have you finished some of your projects? This feels thicker. Natasha asked while looking through the cards. Yup. I finished a Ducati, Kawasaki, and Harley motorcycles. There's also a Ney Lembo and Porsche. Naruto answered. Let me borrow the Harley sometimes. Natasha asked while flashing a puppy-eyed look. Naruto nodded. He can't even think of a reason to say no, not that he wants to. How about this one? 69 GT500 convertible? Great choice, Haim. Naruto said as he took the GT500 card, leaving the rest of the deck with Natasha. Natasha stood up and sauntered over to the shelf, placing the deck near the top, prompting her to stand on her tiptoes just to reach it. That's when Naruto answered one of his questions if Natasha is wearing any underwear. The answer? A big fat no. He released an audible grunt causing Natasha to turn around and, and send a sexy wink. Damn temptress. Naruto whispered to himself, but it looks like Naruto heard it judging from her laugh. Don't give him a hard-on NAT. I still need him for tonight. Jessica suddenly said from behind Naruto, causing Nat and Naruto to turn around. It's hard enough for him to agree right now. Naruto's mind froze when he saw what Jessica was wearing. She's wearing an elegant silver dress with her sides exposed, showing off her tight waist. She turned around, showing off her outfit. If anyone thinks the front is deadly enough, the back is practically a weapon of mass destruction. Basically, Jess is wearing a halter top style dress, leaving her back wholly uncovered. Naruto is sure that the backless design stopped just above her ass. After a few moments of silence and sitting in a daze, Naruto finally came back to the land of the living. God damn it. I'm sure you girls hate me. Naruto exclaimed, causing both of his girlfriends to flash him a questioning look. Your outfits are killing me. Natasha and Jessica looked at each other before laughing hard. Jessica walked over towards Naruto, 
and pulled him up off the couch. Don't be a crybaby. You know we love you too much. Jessica said as she looped her arms around Naruto's neck. Besides, you're immortal. He adopted a petulant look. Jessica planted a peck on his lips, trying to soothe him. Come on. We'll be late. Naruto just nodded, his mind still trying to make sense of what's happening. Natasha walked towards the pair and giving both of them a deep kiss. Have fun, you two. Natasha told both of them before focusing on Jessica. Make sure he doesn't do anything crazy. You might be fighting the triad at the end of the night if you don't place a tight leash on him. She added half seriously. Hey. I resent that. Naruto interjected but was ignored by the girls. Girls. Don't worry. We'll just go for dinner before going straight back home. Jessica replied before tugging on Naruto's sleeve. Naruto, we need to go. All right. Naruto agreed. We'll see you later, NAT. He said before giving her a quick peck and activating Horatian to transport Jessica and himself to the garage under Nat's personal studio. Naruto placed his arm around Jessica's waist to keep her steady since he knows that Horatian landing can make someone unsteady on their feet, even more so that she's wearing fuck-me pumps. Thank you. Jessica said after she finally got her footing. Naruto placed a kiss on her cheek before pulling out the car storage car to pumping his chakra into it. When it started to emit a light blue glow, he faced the card facing away from him until a puff of smoke appeared in front of the couple. When the smoke cloud dissipated, it revealed a glossy royal blue 1969 Shelby GT500 convertible with black stripes running down the center. If you pop the hood of this bad boy, you'll notice that instead of an old-school 428 V8 engine, it has a supercharged V12 engine. The front of the GT500 has been extended to accommodate the massive engine and give space for the supercharger air intake. Just like any of his builds, there is more to the GT500 than meets the eye. Chakra metal and seals have been used anywhere possible. The piece de resistance was the inertial seal he used in the cabin, which he adopted from the Horatian seal. I really want to use those babies. Jessica commented with a groan. Living with Natasha and Naruto for an extended period inevitably caused her to be a motorhead. Why not? I leave most of the deck at the apartment. I even leave the B2 bomber card there. Naruto asked. First of all, I have no use of a souped-up bomber, with what most likely be loaded by a real nuke. Jessica replied with a stern gaze. Naruto's suspicious whistling confirmed her statement. Secondly, we're in New York. It's easier to take the subway. He was forced to agree with what she said. Finally, I got in as a Type C scholarship, for some reason. I can't show anything excessive or I might lose it. Naruto can't correct Jessica's statement as it might confirm her suspicion that he just manipulated the system to get her in. On that note, he needs to make a sleeper car to give Jessica. Maybe a 1970 Mustang that has a false exterior or a 90s Japanese tuner. Let's talk about that later. Naruto walked towards the driver's side door and opening it. Come on. You said we need to hurry. Naruto and Jessica got inside the car before quickly driving off towards the streets. You still haven't told me where we would go. Naruto told Jessica. Just head towards Midtown for now. Jessica replied with a mischievous smile. New York City, New York. February 4th, 2009, 2000 H Local. I don't know if I should kiss you or not. Naruto deadpanned as he was waiting in line for the valet. It's Patsy, or rather Trish. Jessica corrected herself. Is the one that chose the restaurant. Besides, you love the food here. Naruto looked at her incredulously. Of course, I love it. 
Naruto exclaimed. That's my restaurant. Shikugikure, the famous fast food restaurant, has started to open up high-class versions in prime locations ever since the partial merger with Stark Industries. Naruto had to create a whole new menu when Stark mentioned the possibility of opening up a new type of Shikugikure. Critics said that even if Shikugakure has accomplished great success, it was still a fast food restaurant, and can never compete as a high-class restaurant. Everyone changed their tune when the restaurant first opened. The newly opened restaurant quickly jumped through the rankings, and becoming an accredited five-star restaurant within a week, while acquiring three Michelin stars in their next update three months later. Three minutes after Naruto and Jessica started to wait in line for the valet, it's finally their turn. Naruto got out of the car and walked around to open Jessica's door. The young couple had instantly drawn everyone's attention. Naruto shrugged off all the attention, but Jessica feels a little uncomfortable, causing her to stick closer to him. Ignore them. It's just you and me, no one else. Naruto whispered to Jessica's ear, effectively calming her down. The pair walked inside the restaurant towards the maitre d' after they took the valet ticket. Jessica moved in front of the reception. Hi. Good evening. We're meeting someone. Jessica informed with a smile. Of course. Who's the person you are meeting with and your name to confirm with our guest? The maitre d' asked. Jessica Jones meeting Patricia Walker Jess answered. Please wait a moment as we confirm. The maitre d' replied before talking into her radio. Naruto and Jessica were escorted into a waiting area. Why are there only elevators down here? Jessica asked, gesturing towards the only other noticeable feature of the floor other than the reception booth. Tony left the designing the whole place mostly to me. I even replaced the contractor with my clone, so I was able to change and upgrade a lot of stuff. Naruto started in a proud tone. Overall, all ten high-class Shikugakure restaurants all over the world have one basic design. There's a ten-floor enclosed parking building and twenty-five-floor restaurant, first-floor receiving and dispatch, second-floor waste recycling and disposal, third consumable food waste and overrun processing, fourth to fifth cold storage, sixth to seventh general food storage, eighth to ninth food processing and special food storage, tenth non-food storage, eleventh cleaning and sanitation, twelfth break room, thirteenth to twenty-fourth restaurant proper, and twenty-fifth, twenty-fifth security and penthouse. Jessica can't help but stare in awe at how extensive the restaurant was. She should have researched the place even a little bit. That's not even the best part. He added with an almost maniacal grin. What's the best part? Jessica automatically asked in a whisper. Everything no one else knows, even Tony. Jessica had a bad feeling when she saw Naruto's grin turn into a full-blown smile. Don't worry. I didn't use chakra metal and seals on this place. Then what did you do? Let's start with something simple and work our way to more complex stuff. Naruto said before gesturing towards the glass windows. The windows are made up of crystal clear 2-inch bulletproof glass with 4-inch titanium alloy curtains at both sides of the windows. He pointed to the doors. The doors have 10 inches titanium alloy gates. The pillars inside and outside the building have built-in modified phalanx machine guns. He then pointed towards the floor. Both buildings have a customary basement with nothing particular in it, but there are five more floors below it with access tunnels, water purification, and reclaimer, and arc reactors. However, most of the space is dedicated to vertical hydroponic farming. There are already some seeds in there. All it needs is someone to start it up. He took a moment to catch his breath. The food and essentials alone could last the restaurant at full capacity for two weeks. Jessica stayed silent for a few moments before turning towards Naruto. Why did you build a fort in the middle of Manhattan? Jessica said in an eerily flat voice, but Naruto didn't notice the tone. 
The construction of the building happened during my zombie binge phase. Naruto replied while scratching the back of his head. Jessica released a sigh. Zombies. Of course, Naruto would build an overkill of a for fort because of zombies. We'll have a talk with Nat about this Naruto. But for now, you're grounded from your computer setup. Naruto's demeanor dropped when he heard his punishment for building a zombie safe house. It's the logical thing to do. He was about to complain when a waiter approached them. Excuse me. Ms. Walker and company are waiting for you. I'll take you to them. The mail server said. Naruto quickly turned his head to the waiter while delivering a small amount of killer intent, which caused the server to take an unintentional step back. Jess tugged onto Naruto's arm to stop him from killing the guy unintentionally. Thank you. Jessica told the server with a smile. It was barely enough to calm him down. We'll follow you. She continued while pulling Naruto up from the seat. Her whiskered boyfriend was still sulking due to his temporary computer ban. The waiter gulped down to hide his nervousness before walking towards the elevators. Jessica looped her arm around Naruto's and led him to follow the waiter. The trio got out of the 20th floor. The mood was considerably lightened through the short elevator ride. All Jessica had to do was give random kisses and running her hands through Naruto's golden hair. Jessica looked and around the large restaurant floor. It has a modern, classy look, complete with a stage and dance floor. There are wide spaces between the tables preventing it from looking cluttered, while the server room and bar area are at the back of the room. The waiter led them around the tables towards the area where the booths with privacy walls and translucent crystal doors are set up. The server knocked on the door. A few seconds later, the door released a light green glow before the waiter opened the door. The couple immediately saw Trish and her date at one side of the spacious table, leaving the other side empty. Jess. What took you so long? Trish greeted her sister. She stood up from her seat and gave her a brief hug. Getting a little fancy now, are you, Trish? Jessica greeted back with a little teasing before moving to the side. Meet my boyfriend, boyfriend, Naruto Uzumaki. She introduced using his real name. Naruto walked forward and kissing the back of Trish's hand. Hi. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, and I'm here under protests. Naruto introduced himself with a broad smile contrasting his message. Jessica facebombed while Trish adopted a strained smile before looking at her sister. Do I want to know? Trish asked. I just grounded him from playing with his computer. Don't mind him. Jessica answered exasperatedly. But my guildmates and I have a scheduled raid on Saturday. Naruto whined. Then you shouldn't have placed phalanx machine guns in the building. But they're awesome. With a fire rate of 10,000 rounds a minute, they could mow down 1 million zombies per minute, at least. You have 100 machine guns. Jessica exclaimed, not noticing the curious stare from her sister and date. That's it. You're grounded for two weeks. Naruto exaggeratedly dropped down to his knees and sent a silent scream to the heavens. Jessica's face turned the same color as Nat's. Trish is trying to stop herself from releasing a full-blown laugh while her date decided to satisfy his curiosity. Excuse me? Are you talking about a Vulcan phalanx CIWS? Trish's date asked. Naruto quickly recovered and stood up to his feet like nothing happened. He stared at the guy dead in the eyes. All right. Who are you, Jarhead? Can't you see I'm in pain since my girlfriend banned me from my WoW raid? Naruto asked, but the man just returned a disarming smile before standing up. Right. The man extended his hand towards Naruto. I'm Billy Russo, Marine Corps. Chapter 68, Read Author's Note Teaser 
New York City, New York. February 4th, 2009, 2030H Local. I'm Billy Russo, Marine Corps. William Russo or Billy is a 6 feet 1 inch Caucasian with dark eyes and hair. As evident from his nickname, Billy has an attractive face. Combining that with his muscularly lean body and tall frame, he never had problems getting the attention of women and some men. His history, though, is as dark as his eyes. Billy was abandoned by his meth-addicted mother addicted outside a fire station at a very young age. The system took him in, causing him to bounce from foster home to foster home until he was placed in the Ray of Hope group home. That's where he found his love for baseball and the formation of his dream to be the next Joe DiMaggio. Although, that dream of his would crash and burn even before it can take off. One faithful night, when he was 11 years old, one of the good Samaritans of the orphanage named Arthur Walsh took an unhealthy amount of interest in him. He was forced into a secluded area of a park near the orphanage after one stickball game. Arthur yanked his arm, tearing his rotator cuff, before proceeding on to breaking his arm. Good thing, his adrenaline kicked in just in time to fight back and escape. Years later, Billy's patriotism and the lack of prospect to be a baseball star made the choice of joining the U.S. Marine Corps reasonably easy. Everything turned around for him from that point onward. He had made a name for himself in the military, increased his assets, and, best of all, made a buddy he can count on through thick and thin. Ha! Huh. Naruto replied while staring at Billy. So you're who they call pretty face. Billy flinched when he heard the dreaded nickname. Don't get him wrong. He owns up to the moniker when he's at some place even remotely military, but it's an entirely different matter otherwise. But that small detail gave him an idea, an idea about Naruto. You military? Billy asked. Nope. Close though. Naruto answered with a teasing smile before sitting beside Jessica. Billy decided to sit beside Trish. I'm you guys but richer. Naruto was expecting any negative emotion from Billy since he basically admitted being a merc, but was surprised when he detected nothing. Though I'm more into building stuff these days. So you built a phalanx? Billy said incredulously. Yup. Naruto replied while taking two ordering tablets and giving one to Jessica. Tony designed it, but I made it better. Trish choked on the water she's drinking when she heard Naruto's statement. She can't pass up on that juicy detail, especially since she's a radio show host that focuses on relevant topics like privatization of world peace. By Tony designed it, you mean Tony Stark designed the phalanx you improved, right? Trish interjected in the conversation. Chapter 69, Not a Quiet Night New York City, New York February 4th, 2010, 2030H Local I'm Billy Russo, Marine Corps. William Russo or Billy is a 6 feet 1 inch Caucasian with dark eyes and hair. As evident from his nickname, Billy has an attractive face. Combining that with his muscularly lean body and tall frame, he never had problems getting the attention of women and some men. His history, though, is as dark as his eyes. Billy was abandoned by his meth-addicted mother addicted outside a fire station at a very young age. The system took him in, causing him to bounce from foster home to foster home until he was placed in the Ray of Hope group home. That's where he found his love for baseball and the formation of his dream to be the next Joe DiMaggio. Although, that dream of his would crash and burn even before it can take off. One faithful night, when he was 11 years old, one of the good Samaritans of the orphanage named Arthur Walsh took an unhealthy amount of interest in him. He was forced into a secluded area of a park near the orphanage after one stickball game. Arthur yanked his arm, tearing his rotator cuff before proceeding on to breaking his arm. Good thing, his adrenaline kicked in just in time to fight back and escape. Years later, Billy's patriotism 
and the lack of prospect to be a baseball star made the choice of joining the U.S. Marine Corps reasonably easy. Everything turned around for him from that point onward. He had made a name for himself in the military, increased his assets, and, best of all, made a buddy he can count on through thick and thin. Ha! Huh. Naruto replied while staring at Billy. So you're who they call Pretty Face. Billy flinched when he heard the dreaded nickname. Don't get him wrong. He owns up to the moniker when he's at some place even remotely military, but it's an entirely different matter otherwise. But that small detail gave him an idea about Naruto. You military? Billy asked. Nope. Close though. Naruto answered with a teasing smile before sitting beside Jessica. Billy decided to sit beside Trish. I'm you guys but richer. Naruto was expecting any negative emotion from Billy since he basically admitted being a merc, but was surprised when he detected nothing. Though I'm more into building stuff these days. So you built a phalanx? Billy said incredulously. Yup. Naruto replied while taking two ordering tablets and giving one to Jessica. Tony designed it, but I made it better. Trish choked on the water she's drinking when she heard Naruto's statement. She can't pass up on that juicy detail, especially since she's a radio show host that focuses on relevant topics like privatization of world peace. By Tony designed it, you mean Tony Stark designed the phalanx you improved, right? Trish interjected in the conversation. The one and only. Naruto answered before looking over Jess's shoulder, brushing off how monumental is that information. He noticed that she's struggling to choose what she would order. Either because of how extensive the menu is or, more probably, the price of each meal. Get whatever you like, but I would recommend the meals on page 6. He reached inside his pocket and took out a black metal card and placed it on top of his ordering tablet. Everyone in the booth was looking at it curiously to see if something would happen. I got the bill for tonight. No, don't worry about it. It's my treat. Trish countered. Well, my producer's paying for it, but you get the idea. She turned around to Jess when she heard her stifling a laugh. You really don't want to do that unless you want your producer to hate you. Jessica said with an amused smile while glancing at Naruto, who is still looking over the menu. Okay, I'll bite. Why is that? Trish asked, noticing the subtle glance. This guy right here. Jessica replied while pointing towards Naruto. Can eat a ridiculous amount of food when he's on a roll. He's the epitome of a bottomless stomach. I know a lot of guys like him in the military. I remember this guy we call Bubbles, massive dude. Looks a lot like Shaq. He eats 10,000 to 15,000 calories a day. Billy joined the conversation. That's a lot but rookie numbers compared to Naruto. Do you guys know about the steakhouse near John J? Trish and Billy nodded. The Whirlpool Steakhouse in Delhi's origin is a story that is known to a lot of local New Yorkers due to its media coverage. Coverage. Known initially as Jinsiki Food House, the Whirlpool was on the verge of bankruptcy when due to the lack of customers, when they suddenly turned it around and becoming one of the most popular low-medium-cost restaurants in the city. They're famous for their use of different high-quality kinds of beef, including Wagyu. During my first year at John Jay, Naruto would pick me up at least once a week. He would have a snack at that place every time. Jessica started. There's this one time when he didn't know that I won't be able to leave until 7 p.m. because of an exam, and he's already there at 3 p.m. He sank $18,000 that day on food alone. Let me remind you that the meals then cost $50 at most. She explained before pulling onto Naruto's ear, surprising him. Worst of all, he didn't even give me a taste. Ow. 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 What did I do? Naruto exclaimed before rubbing his ear. 
You're not listening, are you? Naruto shook his head no. You're busy ordering, right? This time he shook his head yes. We were talking about the whirlpool. That's just foul. Naruto said with a shake of his head. I was hungry and bored. That's a bad combination. He defended. You didn't even leave me a sandwich. Jessica countered. The argument slash foreplay would have continued if not for a sudden notice that there's someone at the other side of the door. Trish quickly stood up and unlocked the door. The door opened, revealing a man wearing a suit carrying a tablet of his own. He walked in and closed the door behind him. Mr. Uzumaki. I'm Ellis Jackson, the general manager for the week. The man introduced himself respectfully. Naruto moved out of his seat and approached the GM. We have prepared the penthouse and rooftop suite if you would like to use it. it. Naruto placed an arm around the GM's shoulder and pulled him closer. Nah, don't worry about it. Just keep the orders coming and all would be a-okay. I have a request, though. Well, three actually. Just tell me what it is, and I'll sure to make it done. The GM replied enthusiastically. Trisha and Jess could practically see a wagging dog's tail behind him. First, cancel their orders. They have no idea what they want. This drew various reactions from inside the booth, but Naruto ignored them. Secondly, open up the secret menu for us. I know for a fact that the ingredients came in last night. That certainly got everyone's attention. Lastly, don't tell Tony that I'm here. You don't need to hide, but just don't inform him. I'll head to the system port and do what you asked for, Mr. Uzumaki. The GM said before rushing out of the booth. Naruto gave himself a nod before sitting back on the chair. He could feel the stares of Trish and Billy on him, but thought nothing of it. Jess is by his side, trying to hide her amusement. Hold up. Are we just going to ignore that? Trish voiced out. Billy agreed with that statement. Ignore what? Naruto replied flatly while combing through the menu, possibly looking at the secret menu which everyone was waiting for. That. Billy supplemented before pointing at the door. He acted like he's your boss, and you're going to fire him any time. Especially about being the general manager for the weak thing. Trish added. That's because I can fire him, and unless he got at least 75 over 100 on his weekly assessment, he would be axed at the end of the week. Naruto answered seriously. Trisha and Billy gawked at Naruto like he grew another head while Jessica is thoroughly enjoying that someone else's minds are blown this time. Naruto, on the other hand, kept on ordering foods. After a significant amount of time, Trish finally decided to break the silence. Jess, we're going to have a long talk after this. Trish told Jess without, without any room to argue. Jess let out a hearty laugh, backslash. Come on. Let's order. I'm getting hungry. Naruto exclaimed with a cheerful disposition, contrasting his earlier attitude. Jessica released another chuckle before picking up the ordering tablet, which Trish and Billy copied. Seriously, Tony's Mark II suit costs around 100 mil, and he uses it as a coat rack. He won't even let me borrow the thing. Naruto exclaimed before taking another sushi. I'm telling you. The governor is an asshole and a pervert. He only looked at my face like 30% of the time. Trish complained emphatically. My classmate would still be trying to get into my pants if Naruto didn't scare the living shit out of him. I mean, who doesn't understand that when a chick breaks your arm, she's not interested? Jess said before downing a shot of sake. Frank then caught the grenade midair before throwing it back from wherever it came from. To this day, that's one of the most badass and flashiest things I ever saw. Billy finished his story. 
Oh yeah. That hit the spot. Naruto exclaimed while snuggling towards Jess. You ate like ten full courses. I would be surprised if it didn't hit the spot. Jessica teased while running her hands through his hair, causing him to drowse off. Goddamn Jess. You need to marry him ASAP if he cooks like that. Trish commented while leaning on Billy. We can't precisely marry unless we go to the Middle East. Jessica replied awkwardly. Oh right. Forgot about that part. Trish let out. Okay. What are you guys talking about? Billy interjected. Why do you need to go to the sandbox just to get married? We're not exactly in a conventional relationship. Jessica answered, still not stopping from running her hands through Naruto's hair. She's hoping he would fall asleep and pass the conversation, no matter how unlikely it was. Let's just say I'm girlfriend number two. He's cheating with you? Billy asked. No, no, no. Jessica vehemently denied. We are in a polygamous relationship. We even live in the same apartment. Damn. I don't know what. To say. Billy admitted absentmindedly. The trio continued with their conversation for a few moments before Naruto suddenly straightened from his seat and reached inside his pocket, earning a few questioning states from everyone. He pulled out his phone and pressed a button. Hey. Tony. You're on speaker. Naruto greeted. Hey, hi. Tony greeted back. What are you doing? He asked, but you can hear the wind rushing from the other side. Billy, Trish, and Jess are listening in on the conversation, especially the first two since they're assuming that this Tony is Tony Stark himself. I'm on a date with Jess and her sister. Naruto answered. What? You're adding another one. Tony exclaimed. Hell no. Jess's sister is on a date with a jarhead. Naruto countered. Why is it so loud there anyway? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Tony said while a series of gunfire can be heard in the background. I need some help. You have someone near the East Village? Yeah. I'm in Shoku right now. Great. Can you send over my suit? These assholes won't let up. All right. All right. Give me a minute. Naruto grumbled before placing the phone back in his pocket. He took the car keys and valet card from his pocket and handed it over to Jess. I have to go. You can go home ahead of me if I'm not back. Sure you want me to take the GT? Jess asked with a raised eyebrow. Why not? You can handle her just fine. Naruto countered while standing up from his seat. Anyway, it's nice to meet you too, but I have to cut it short for now. He, apologet he apologetically said to both Trish and Billy before giving Jess a kiss on her cheek. I'll see you at home later or tomorrow, depending on how big this thing is. I'll let Nat know. Jess replied with a smile. Naruto returned the smile before rushing out of the booth. Jessica picked up the key and valet ticket and placed it inside her purse. When she looked up, she saw the Trish and Billy staring at the door. Ha, huh, I don't know what to say. Billy commented before bottoming up his beer. New York City, New York. February 4, 2010. 2300 H local. Tony decided to visit the Stark Expo grounds since it's in the final stages of construction. He wouldn't normally do something as inane as an inspection, but the Stark Expo is something he inherited from his father. That's why he's making sure that everything goes smoothly. He also had another goal of checking out a building where he would build the Stark Tower. Everything went to shit when they were about to leave the Expo. 
Tony visited the grounds at the same time as some unsavory figures building some backdoors entrances to the expo. Unluckily, he didn't bring his suit with him, and his security team was quickly overwhelmed them. The only reason Tony managed to get away was that the guys who are after him wanted to take him alive, most probably because they want his suit. He got out of the expo grounds before they have surrounded him, and worked his way to a truck garage a few hundred meters away. Good thing a truck driver, who's a former army guy from what Tony could tell, helped him out. The driver was supposed only to drive him towards the Stark Industries, but the assholes found them, and they are trying to run them off the road. After a few minutes of cat and mouse, Tony decided he had enough and called the big guns. They were trying to dodge the hail of gunfires when they both heard something dropping from behind them. Tony quickly tur turned around and saw Naruto sitting at the back seat with his suit. The truck swerved a little because of the driver's surprise. I got your suit right here. Naruto said casually while patting the suitcase-sized Mark 4.5. I'm not even going to question how you got here. Just switch seats with me. Tony replied while scooching over to the back seat, and Naruto moving to the passenger side. The seal I placed on your arm. I can track you anywhere if you think about it. Naruto answered before looking towards the driver. How are you holding up? Good, actually. The whole thing is giving me nostalgia. The driver answered. Naruto looked at the guard weirdly for a moment before asking. You're not going to ask how I suddenly appeared at the back of your truck. Tony Stark is in my truck with men in black chasing the hell out of us. The driver replied with a shrug. Besides, I'm in the army. Need to expect the unexpected. Damn. You take shit a whole lot better than the jarhead I met earlier tonight. Naruto commented honestly, causing the guy to smile. What's your name anyway? Sergeant Kyle Reese. Got out of the army a year ago. Kyle introduced himself while making a sharp turn at an intersection. Well, nice to meet you, Sergeant Reese. Nathan Umber, private contractor. Naruto said before he suddenly felt a tap on his shoulder, causing him to turn around. I'm going to go out of the roof and deal with the ants. Tony informed the pair before flying through the roof. Naruto released a sigh while looking at the hole formed at the top of the truck and pulled out his phone. Jarvis, send over the best articulated truck SI has to the New York main office? Naruto texted. He received a confirmation a few minutes later. Chapter 70, Poison in My Blood New York City, New York. February 4th, 2009, 2310H Local. As soon as Naruto got the confirmation from Jarvis and placed his phone back in his pocket, he heard a few explosion explosions and gunfire in the background. A few minutes later, the truck shook because Tony dropped from the open roof. They're from the Ten Rings. Tony stated before removing his faceplate. All of them. He added seriously. So someone helped them inside the country considering how much firepower and resources they have. Naruto concluded. I got a feeling which group helped them. Reese pulled the truck over to a large alleyway and released a sigh of relief before looking around. He paled slightly when he saw the damage inside the cabin. He doesn't even want to think about the outside damage. All the gunfire must have made the exterior look like Swiss cheese. Don't worry about it. Naruto told Reese, trying to reassure the ex-soldier. We'll handle everything. It's the least we can do for keeping this guy alive. He continued while pointing at Tony. But in the meantime. I need you to get out of the truck. This caused him to receive a questioning stare from both Tony and Kyle. Okay. Did I miss something? Kyle asked, not really liking the fact that he's getting kicked off his truck. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're a nobody compared to Tony, 
and the fact that you have not met any cops in the first 10 minutes of the chase means they have someone inside the government, either local or national. Naruto stated with absolute certainty. Tony immediately got the implication, but Kyle doesn't seem to get it, and it showed on his face. Tony and I are rich. Those men in black guys will either be let out or swept under the rug. That leaves one target. He added. They'll crucify the hell out of you since they need someone to blame the whole thing, and you're the convenient scapegoat. Fuck. Reese cursed silently before picking up a cap from his dashboard, dashboard, and other personal effects. All right, all right. I'm out of here. He said while opening the door. Naruto reached inside his jacket pocket and took out an access card and a check before handing it all to Kyle. Just go to Stark Industries tomorrow afternoon and give this card to the reception. The check, on the other hand, is a cover when you are inevitably questioned. So you should deposit it by tomorrow morning. Naruto explained. Naruto collected a few pieces of stuff from Tony in case of emergency. One of those things is a VIP access card for company executives and a few checks with different amounts. He never expected that he would be able to use the check, but good thing he had Tony make some. Okay. I'll be there at four. Kyle replied before jumping out of the truck and walking away. Naruto moved over to the driver's side, while Tony scooted over to the passenger side. What are we going to do now? Tony asked. He had an idea what Naruto would suggest, but it's better to be sure. We're going to do our civic duty, and you are going to report this to the police. Naruto said with a grin. He's just going to let Tony run his mouth. Call lawyer. You should make a record for this since the Senate is working their way up to your ass about the suit. Yeah, yeah. Tony replied, a little disgruntled. Aren't I technically your boss? Naruto looked at Tony incredulously while hiding a bit of his amusement. So, boss, what's the plan? Naruto said sarcastically. Shut up. Tony grumbled out. He knows that no matter how smart he is, he doesn't have a mind for strategy and planning. He's more of a straightforward attack guy. Let's just go. The 82nd precinct is the closest one here. No way. We're going to the 99th. I have a friend there. His team rotation should have the night shift until next week. Naruto countered before starting the truck again, but it wouldn't start right away. How the hell were you able to meet someone from the NYPD? Tony asked, genuinely curious. He knows Naruto doesn't have that much free time, and he never uses clones for social interactions. We're guildmates in World of Warcraft. We never met in person, but I know of him. Tony hid his amusement about Naruto's statement. He can't help but imagine a pasty white desk cop that may be on the larger side of the size scale. He was snapped into thinking when the truck finally started. Oh yeah? Let's go. New York City, New York. February 4th, 2010, 2320H local. You didn't think this through, did you? Tony said with a shit-eating grin. Isn't it obvious? Naruto groaned out while continuously banging his head on the stirring wheel. Now one might wonder what mess Naruto got himself into this time. Well, this mess this time is caused by simple oversight. He forgot the fact that cops would immediately surround a semi that parked in front of a police precinct. You get the assault rifle and spotlight bonus if the truck is littered with bullet holes. The only reason he could think of why they aren't being forced out of the vehicle was that Tony is inside the car while wearing his Iron Man suit. Naruto only looked up from the steering wheel when he heard the telltale noise of a megaphone. Get out of the vehicle slowly while keeping your arms up and hands closed. Someone commanded, showing that the guy is somewhat knowledgeable about Tony's suit. 
Naruto and Tony can't see the guy since the spotlights are making him look like a silhouette. Naruto and Tony nodded at each other before following the instructions. They slowly walked in front of the truck while still keeping their arms up. Ahem. Tony cleared his throat, effectively getting everyone's attention. We come in peace. He loudly added, successfully imitating a first encounter. We would like to speak, speak with. He continued before facing Naruto. What was the guy's name again? He asked in a whisper. Ebony Eagle loves yogurt, Ebony Eagle 3 yogurt. Naruto answered. Seriously. Tony groaned out. Didn't you know his name? Of course, I know. But he doesn't know that I know. Naruto reasoned. I'm not saying that. Tony gritted through his teeth. Fine. Then I'll do it. Naruto said before taking one slow step forward, but that's enough to get everyone's attention. We are here to report a crime. Not done by us, obviously, but to us. Evident by the bullet holes all over the truck. He explained, causing everyone to relax slightly. If Tony Stark in his Iron Man suit is not refuting that statement, then it must be true on some level. We would like to talk to a detective about this. His gaming handle is Ebony Eagle Loves Yogurt. Naruto was waiting for the inevitable round of laughter, but he could see that everyone turned their head towards the guy carrying the megaphone to his surprise. The huge guy walked forward, finally making him visible to both Tony and Naruto. I'm the Ebony Eagle. Detective Terence Terry Jeffords. A muscular African-American man spoke up confidently. Everybody stand down but squad one to three will remain on guard in case something happens. We are officially on high alert. He ordered, causing Tony to raise an eyebrow since a detective doesn't have the authority for something like that. Come on. Let's get inside and write up a report about it. He added before walking back inside the precinct. Naruto shrugged at Tony before following behind Terry, but not before noticing that none of the cops are following. They must be squad one and two while squad three is at the balcony. So how do you know, know about the Ebony Eagle? Well, everyone in the Guild of the Band of Heroes should know about the Immortal Paladin. Naruto answered. Terry stopped in his tracks and looked at Naruto. Your voice does sound familiar. Terry replied while thinking back on the Guild members, and he could only think of one guy. Their sketchy night elf rogue. Ninja? The one and only. Damn. Terry exclaimed while looking at Naruto up and down. His years of being a criminal detective enabled him to see how expensive the blonde suit. That's not even mentioning the watch and shoes. And you're playing Warcraft. I have nothing to do on the weekends, and I like playing games. Naruto said in a matter-of-factly kind of way right before they got inside the elevator. Tony took a hesitant step inside the elevator when he saw how old it looks like. The suit weighed quite a bit, even if he removed most of the armor plating and used lighter but weaker materials to greatly reduce the weight. However, the suit still weighs 150 kilograms. Still a long way from his goal of 20 kilograms, but still lighter than his 300 kilograms Mark III. So it's clearly a relief when the overweight sign flashed, he didn't suddenly create a hole at the floor, or the elevator didn't straight up crash. Weekends? Aren't you online every day since I can see you from time to time during my day offs? Terry mused out loud. I have someone that goes online for me every day to get the daily login bonus, especially when I'm busy. Naruto replied. That someone, however, is one of his clones, though. Terry just nodded and waited for the elevator door to open, but he didn't expect, expect complete pandemonium from the other side of the door. That's not exactly right. He expected an uproar but because of the sudden attack, not because of Tony Stark. 
everyone is lined up in front of the elevator with an excited look. At the helm of the crowd, a certain Jacob Jake Peralta. Ames. 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 He has his suit on. Jake practically shouted before walking towards Tony with a marker. Sign my arm for me, please. Tony practically beamed when he heard the statement. He thrived in being in the center of attention. That just how it is ever since in college and though his family is off limits. He immediately went into his practiced routine when dealing with fans, when he actually gives a fuck, unlike most of the time. While the rest of the crew are surrounding the Iron Man, Terry guided Naruto to his desk so that he could at least say that someone is doing their job. He wouldn't admit to anyone that he would ask for an autograph later. What guy doesn't appreciate a full-body suit of armor? Terry gestured to Naruto to sit down beside his desk and opened up a police incident report. So, tell me what happened. Terry told Naruto. Ooh. Do I have a story for you? Naruto said excitedly. It started when my girlfriend arranged a double date with her sister. New York City, New York. February 4th, 2010, 0000H local. If that's really what happened, I'll never doubt the stories you are telling in the chat. Terry said after 30 minutes of Naruto's storytelling, while reading over the incident report. It looks like the script of an over-the-top action movie. But maybe that's just how your life would be if you're friends with Tony Stark. I'm going to send this to the servers and request for someone to look into why no one responded to a car chase through the city. You could ask Tony for a video copy of his attack to add to the file. The file. Naruto replied. That could certainly help. Terry answered. Naruto nodded and looked around for Tony. He saw him in the break room, still surrounded by excited cops listening to some of his stories. He's pretty sure that some of the stories Tony told are classified. The blonde ninja stood up and approached the armor-wearing genius. Tony. Naruto called out. We can go now, but can you leave a copy of the counterattack for filing? He added. It looks like time's up. Tony said to the crowd, causing some to groan in disappointment. He walked out of the room and approached Naruto. I just need a USB port to connect to. Connect with Terry's desk. I'll talk to him for a while you upload the AV. Naruto replied. Naruto and Terry talked about different topics, but mostly focusing on PC gaming, while Tony uploaded the AV from his suit. Five minutes later, Tony finished his upload. The pair said a quick goodbye to everyone in the station before Tony flew out of the station balcony while carrying Naruto. They landed in an alleyway a few blocks away from the 99th precinct. No matter what happens, we're never going to do that again. Naruto exclaimed as soon as they landed while moving away from Tony and moving his pants around. I was practically wedged throughout the whole flight. Tony's faceplate opened up and looked at Naruto incredulously before releasing a burst of full-blown laughter. Naruto waited for Tony to calm down with a deadpan stare. You done now? Tony wiped an imaginary tear from the side of his eyes before straightening back up. Yeah, yeah. Tony answered. Want me to carry you back to wherever you live in this city? He asked seriously. Fuck you. No need to be vulgar. Tony countered while still having that shit-eating grin of his before getting a serious expression. You told me you hand an idea about who helped the Ten Rings. Let me cut you off right there. Naruto interjected while fixing up his suit and tie. I'm 90% sure who helped them, but I'm not giving you any detail about them. He saw Tony was about to cut in, so cut him off before Tony could even say anything. First of all, I ain't telling you squat about the group. Information about this group is above top classified, and they're massive. 
at least 50 times more powerful than the Ten Rings, even after I've been slowly chipping away their forces in the past three years. I have a group already that's preparing to bring down this group, but you might just fuck everything up if you come barging in. He explained but purposely leaving out the information that they are the same guys that attacked during Tony's wedding. More importantly, you're not fit enough to do anything about it now. What are you talking about? Tony asked, acting dumb. Oh, come on. Don't use that bullshit on me. Naruto exclaimed with a sneer. Did you forget who I am? I'm a fucking god with magical bullshit eyes. I can practically feel your life force ebbing away. It's much worse when you are actively using your suit. I can see the palladium wreaking havoc inside your body. Tony remained silent throughout the explanation. The only reason I haven't told Pepper anything was because you're doing something about it like the chlorophyll, or the secret research into other possible sources of energy. Tony stayed in silent contemplation for a moment before he asked something in a quiet voice. You're not going to tell her, do you? Maybe after two months, I'll be forced to say something. Naruto replied, but continued when he saw Tony's questioning look. Without intervention, and you continuing your chlorophyll treatment, you'll last till the end of the year. But with your current use of that armor of yours, you have until a month after the Stark Expo. Tony released a round of self-deprecating chuckle. Should I be worried that you know that much? Well, you shouldn't have given me open access to Jarvis. Naruto answered. You already found a solution, didn't you? Tony stated plainly. Found some options, but I don't know if it will work. I'm not. A genius, remember. Naruto replied. If worst comes to worst, I can just heal you. I've been practicing my medical ninjutsu for a couple of years now, so at the very least, you shouldn't explode in a rain of blood and gore. That doesn't exactly give a sense of comfort. See Tony deadpanned. It shouldn't. Naruto said with a grin before looking at his watch. It's already late. I'm going to go home now. I want to see if the ladies are still awake. He continued before suddenly disappearing leaving Tony in the sketchy alleyway. Fucking overpowered magical ninja, leaving me alone for some chicks. Tony grumbled before suddenly stopping. What the hell am I saying? I would drop everything too for my girls. He added before flying back to Stark Industries to check on his security since they should be there according to Jarvis, although some are pretty banged up.